Andrew Gibbons, that's me. Rebecca Norton is, up, is there. I say up there. Um, it's currently in, in the panel. Are looking at the 10 components of a thinking environment. Nancy Klein, we've reached halfway point. Uh, this one's a big one. This one for me is the core of the book. Time to think is the book. Giving space, not rushing. Ease is the issue. She says, offering freedom from rush or urgency. But there's more to it than that, isn't there, Rebecca? Ease. Yes, it's that feeling of having the space and the time to think, like it says on the book cover, basically. If you know that you're not going to be rushed, you know that you can take as long as you need to think, to talk, then you don't have to panic. Your thinking can relax and you can, you know, you can dig down a little bit deeper. When you know you've got a time constraint, it really does limit your thinking because you're thinking, oh, oh well, you know, you're sort of half watching the clock, half trying to think of what you wanted to say, half trying to put your sentences together, checking the other person. And it really is not conducive to thinking, to communicating well. This, this is a biggie. This is really important, I think, yeah. When you say, when you say not being rushed, it's evident and it's obvious when you are being rushed because... Uh, the other person, if a conversation partner or other people in the room are looking distracted, they're looking ill at ease, they're looking like they're about to interrupt you, uh, they've got that face on that says, I'm not even hearing what you're saying because I'm going to say something straight after you finish. And people like me talk quick for that reason, because they try and squeeze as many words in as they possibly can because they're not going to be interrupted and here they go. Oh. And m then most of what's been said is wasted. Because what's the point of encouraging somebody to say something if you're not listening to them, not showing the respect that they're due when they're speaking, because all you're going to do is to dismiss what they've said or show you've not listened to it? Yeah, I, you, you've linked it there to a couple of points, haven't you, really? So ease creates that sense of sort of comfort for the person who's thinking they know they're not going to be interrupted they know nobody's going to jump in they know they've got as long as they need but also it means then that the people listening also understand that, that person can take as long as they want so you may as well listen you do need to listen you do need to take things on board as well and and i think it, it allows having that sense of ease allows for the silences um I think, again, sometimes people get really uncomfortable when the silence and somebody's itching to jump in and they think, oh, you know, do we, need, do we need to say something? This is getting quite awkward. And actually, all it means is the person is thinking. I've seen this happen before where people have been busy thinking. And if you, if you were genuinely paying attention and watching, you can see when somebody's thinking. Just because they're not saying anything doesn't mean to say there's nothing going on up here. And then suddenly somebody blurts in because there's silence and that's it lost the train of thought and, it, and it's wasted. So that sense of ease is really, really important. You know, when I've been looking through Nancy's books and I won't pretend to have read them yet, simply flick pages and seeing things I like because I wanted to relate to it at that level before I got deeply into it. This is not me bigging myself up. I thought, hey, I've been doing this stuff for quite a long time. I've got a OHP slide that became a PowerPoint slide called Why Do We Interrupt? And that's been about 15 years old. Hey! And also this, I encourage people to say in conversation, and I have done for many years, give me a moment. I want to think about what you just said. And that's a respectful thing. And I've said that's a respectful thing. Even on the phone, I've said to people, if I go quiet for a moment, it's because I'm thinking about what you've had to say. I don't think anyone's ever said that to me, by the way, on the phone but I've encouraged others to do that. So I kind of think, hey, uh, I was into Nancy before Nancy's books even. So I, that's why I can relate to this stuff because I know its value and I so rarely see its practice. You're thinking. <laughs> and that's good. <laughs> Would you like to think some more, Rebecca? I'm trying to be, I'm, it's too easy to become facetious because I've seen videos of Nancy and of Nancy's coaching in a thinking environment, disciples, if you like, people have been accredited in that. And they talk about inviting people to think further. A lot of coaches take great pride in their questioning technique and their bank of questions. Rubbish! You, you, you shouldn't be asking your questions in distraction to where you would think they should go. You should be saying, have you got more to say? 
would you like to think about that further? Yeah, I know it's that little bit of prompting that often gets the brain going down another little hole, doesn't it? You know, and thinking of something else. I love watching people think, actually. And I was watching a very experienced coach. Um, I had the opportunity to observe a coaching session and um, very experienced and she was doing it really well. And it was a demonstration, so I guess there wasn't necessarily as much ease as what there needed to be. But it was really... it it's brutal when you watch somebody mm. and you see them thinking and then somebody asks them another question or makes a comment you think they were thinking you just interrupted them and actually once you learn what you're looking for it is so clear to see you know and it, it is it's like it's almost like a physical assault on somebody because they're just it's almost really pushing into their space they're in they're in that space where they're thinking and you can see the thinking and I, and I love that about about this actually yeah Nancy Klein <clears throat> I sound like a disciple here says that interruption is a violent act and no she's she's not someone who pushes words around without consciously thinking deliberately about their impact she uses the word violent deliberately she says an interruption is a violent act I think it is. Mm. I just think how many acts of violence are committed in the meeting room. <laughs> <laughs> it's not funny. It's not funny because it's tragic. It, it limits is, yeah. it limits the use of talent. It inhibits innovation. It stops organizations being as effective as they otherwise would be if they showed more respect to each other and if they provided more ease when someone's... If, if I'm in a meeting and I see people talking fast, I know they're doing it for a reason. And they're trying to squeeze words in that aren't going to get listened to anyway. Um, I like to be in meetings where people have pauses, silences, and speak in a more, as I'm doing now, normal way. Yeah, and it's so true, isn't it? you can see when people feel that they need to brush or there's a worry that they've got to get their my penneth in before, you know, the next person or before the meeting ends and what have you. And I think, again, I think we have to take some responsibility for this, that if you know you're going to have to have a, either a challenging conversation or a more detailed conversation with somebody, you don't arrange it in your 50 minute break. Uh. Actually put aside time proper time to do it because otherwise the worst thing is somebody's looking at the watch mm. watching it doesn't it doesn't inspire you to keep talking does it and to keep thinking when you're thinking this person needs to go they, they obviously seem distracted so you haven't got the full attention and you haven't got that sense of ease because you're worried that at any minute in time they're going to tell me that they've got to go or we haven't got time or we're going to have to talk about this at a later point that is not conducive to thinking it's a very liberating thing to not feel the need to be constantly thinking of what you need to say next. It's a very liberating thing to say, I might park everything I might have said in this conversation because all I'm going to do is show interest in what the other person's saying and encouraging them to think further. That's many steps too far for a lot of people and I think they've got to justify why that's the case. Mm. And it's not always easy, but I think we're missing out on a lot of ideas and a lot of talent by rushing things and how often do people come away from a meeting saying god I wish I'd said that or I wish I'd said that differently and that's because they haven't had that time or been given that space to think and to talk without being interrupted, without that fear of being interrupted. Just knowing that somebody might interrupt you, even if they don't, is still enough to put you off track. I think the reality is that a lot of what is said to and at people is not a fascination to them. It's not something they find interesting. It might not be someone they like or found interesting in the past. So this is a very difficult thing to do. Irrespective of the barriers to doing it, it's entirely possible. This is not something you need to study for eight years to do. This is not something you need to develop 
over a period of huge practice. We can do this immediately if we've got the will. Yeah. And it's interesting because I think some people fear that it will take, you know, if, if there's no sense of urgency, well, the meeting might drag on. How many times have you sat in a meeting that's dragged on, dragged on, and still not actually achieved anything of use at the end of it? And then you've had to create another meeting to do the same all over again. Or actually, if we set it up in a better way in the first place, yes, it might be a bit longer, but the quality of thinking will be better. The results will be better. And you don't need to keep having meeting after meeting to go round in circles where nobody feels listened to and nothing gets moved forward. I think meetings are the obvious vehicle for a lot of this in terms of a workplace context. It's also conversational, transactionally mm. between people. How many meetings have we been in when the real meeting takes place afterwards in the corridor, when people then get together in threes and fours and do the real business, talk about what they didn't get a chance to in the meeting because the boss or others dominated like they always do. These are difficult behaviours to break out of when they become apparently embedded. All it takes, big capital neon sign all, is the will to unpick that behaviour. It's a huge all, and my fear as ever that people will knowingly settle for acceptable underperformance. This the phrase I use a lot. This is as good as I'm prepared to get no one's on my back needing me to. We could be so much more effective individually and collectively if we did this stuff. In, in, I think it could change work cultures and performance massively, even if we just incorporated one or two of these elements. Never mind all 10 of them. One or two elements would make a huge difference. I'm going to stop it there because... We could go on for another three hours on this one, perhaps we would another time. We've reached a point on this critical aspect of the 10 that covers enough ground for people to take on board. Yes.